Hello and welcome to the Read to Know podcast, where the goal is to actually remember what you read. On this podcast, we go through a book one chapter at a time, and each week we actually practice remembering what we've read. So we don't just remember, but then we can actually better apply it to our life. If you want to follow along, we're currently working our way through Stephen Covey's book, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. I'm Zach Brown, and my friend Chris Yarber is joining me to help discuss and break down this book. Also, if you've been listening and following along up to this point, we're super stoked that you're here, and we'd love to hear from you. So please reach out and uh, say hello. We are at Read to Know Pod on all platforms. Uh, also, if you listen on Apple Podcasts, please leave a rating and a review. It would help us a ton. And uh, if you don't have Apple Podcasts, no worries. Just share this with a friend who might be interested. Anyway, thanks again for listening and enjoy the conversation. All right, Chris, we have made it to the end of this book. We are on the last chapter, um, Inside Out Again. Mm -hmm. And then next week, we're starting a new book. We're starting Dream Big by Bob Goff. Yeah. And uh, I'm looking forward to it. I, yeah. I think you're looking forward to it as well. I am. I love I love Bob Goff, just his personality, his writing. You can definitely see his personality in his writing. Uh, if you've ever seen him in a, in a video, you hear his voice when you read his books. That's how good of a communicator right. and writer I think he is. So I am really looking forward to yeah. this new book. Yeah, and we wanted to switch it up too. We wanted to have this to this next book to have a kind of a different feel to it, a different yeah. uh, vibe to it, if you will. And I think it's kind of funny. Uh, Seven Habits was written originally in 1989, mm -hmm. I think. And uh, this book, Dream Big by Bob Goff, uh, uh, came out this year in 2020. Yeah. So... Um, like 30 years different, yeah. 30, yeah, 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 it's so, crazy. So uh, we're trying to uh, switch it up, Yep. and uh, it'll be fun because we're also switching it from a weekly podcast mm -hmm. to now for this book, we'll see as as other books down the road if we're, what we'll do, we might go back to a week weekly podcast, but for this book specifically, we're going to switch it up to a daily podcast, so every day, so you guys can get the book, um, follow along, read it with us, and then listen in to the podcast Uh daily so yeah. i think that'll be fun to switch it up in that way too right yeah whereas this book took you know a couple months to do uh this next book will be just about a month just yeah. right at a month with 29 chapters 29 right. days uh so right at a month uh so it's we're gonna move quickly through it but i think it's going to be uh fun for listeners and and watchers uh to to be able to break it down every single day um instead of having to wait weekly for you know a new podcast to come out but the chapters are a lot shorter so it makes right. a lot of sense to do it day day by day um they are a lot shorter just as this chapter this last chapter inside out again is a lot shorter i was kind of yeah. surprised that it's length were you surprised by it um yeah oh, i mean it kind of made sense he didn't he he was just kind of summing up the entire book and he basically gave a couple illustrations a couple examples and mm -hmm. stories um to kind of illustrate the seven habits kind of i thought to me was kind of just like how they play, how they can play out in real life. An example right. of how they play out in real life. Right. And mostly that is with him dealing with his wife and kids and mostly um, him and his, re his relationship with his wife and how he communicates with her um, and basically breaking down the barriers that we maybe subconsciously hold up from uh, communicating with each other. Something that some, a place to where we actually want to go, I think we want to get to, right. but just through life and interacting with each other, we tend to, from either comments that other people say, um, as we'll get into the kind of key elements he has, mm -hmm. his unspoken rules for deep communication, Right. Um, we, we tend to not get there, as he calls it, to a place of deep communication, basically um, just because we don't allow that and we don't have a space uh, to get to that and basically through the set using the seven habits as a way to get there is a is a is a good uh route to take yeah. to get there and it's really um something that he basically in combining all this and kind of just talking at in a very in a very um top down overview sense it's uh very practical and um 
it's a very practical way to get there is right. using the seven habits. And it's kind of the natural things that flow out of the seven habits. Right. Yeah. He doesn't mention each habit specifically. So if you're reading this chapter and, and you don't see the word proactive or you don't see the word, you know, seek first to understand, if you don't see those, he does mention a couple by name. However, you can definitely see all the elements of the private and public victories all wrapped up in this chapter, which gets him to the place where him and his wife uh, and his children were at one point as he's kind of reflecting on his on his life. And you can definitely tell that this chapter has a little bit more heart invested mm-hmm. in it. You know, you can kind of see where, where he's coming from, um, from the inside and it's coming out to use the name of the chapter, uh, because of the, because of the personal examples, but also because of the uh, passion, I think that he speaks to when he talks about this. Um, cause he starts off this chapter by, by mentioning uh, a quote, uh, or summarizes a quote that he read, uh, from from uh, an essay or a book that touched him very personally. Right. He uh, says it kind of shook his paradigms. Yeah, yeah. It kind of transformed the way that he looked at, you know, not only these habits, but also conversations and relationships. And then he gives an example of this with the story that he tells of him and his wife in their time in Hawaii. But he, he says that this essay, this book that he pretty much read, uh, pretty much said that the space uh, or the gap between um stimuli stimulus yeah and response response thank you stimulus and response um the gap between those is where we see the most growth and the most happiness right and so it's between stimulus and response that him and his wife grow together and they grow in their conversation and synergy is created and win-win is created and he mentions two two rules uh that they don't necessarily speak out loud but they kind of developed as they grew in mm-hmm. this space. Yeah. Um, and the first one was no probing, no probing. Yeah. <laughs> I'm having, I'm having a hard time. <laughs> no probing. And then the second one is if it's too painful to stop talking about, right. It. If and it's come too back painful later. Or too, yeah. To come back later. Yeah. yeah. Whenever that person is ready to pick up. Yeah. Um, so you thank know, it's you. okay. Sometimes thank the you for shortest, your help on that. Sometimes the shortest chapters, you know, they, they're, they're the, the, the most, most difficult. Yeah. 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 Um, hopefully that won't be the case when we open up uh, dream big. So, cause those chapters are only a couple pages, oh, I know. like three, four pages. I so. know. Gosh. <laughs> we should do pretty well it's, with those. Yeah. Yeah. It's always when you hit record before you hit record, you know, the conversation yeah. is flowing, but yeah. Anyway, yeah. thank you for but that. But let's, uh, I want to back up and talk about that idea of the gap between stimulus and response for a little bit, yes. because I think that's an interesting idea. And, and what's interesting to me about it is there's not only, like he said, there's a chance for growth and, and as he says, growth and happiness mm-hmm. and, 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 um, you know, proactive behavior basically mm-hmm. in, in, in between there, but it's also that there just, there is a gap between stimulus and response, right? Right. Um, something happens, there's, you know, stimuli and there is a gap between our response and basically just the idea again kind of falls back to habit one be proactive is that we have the ability to choose our response just because something happens we don't immediately have some kind of uh, uh um nonsensical uh just immediate reaction to it but we can actually we can actually take a step back and separate i hit the microphone there oops uh, <laughs> uh, separate the stimulus from the response right we can separate those two and 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 again, that just kind of falls back to basically habit one being proactive. And uh, yeah, it's just kind of, I think that's what he said. He kind of, that kind of spurred on some of the thoughts of, you know, the seven habits and in that. And and that even spurred on probably the latter habits of, you know, the, the um, interdimensional habits, the public victories, four, mm-hmm. five, and six. Mm-hmm. Um, in when he's talking to his wife, you know what I mean? When he's talking to his wife and in those in examples and stories that he gives, um, you know, they're thinking win-win. They're, um, he's seeking first to understand with her in ways that maybe he had never before in their marriage up until that point. Right, yeah, because he specifically mentions that he, he with with that not probing part, is is that when, when they would dive really deep into conversations and they would rather get emotional and they were working in that social and emotional, Mm -hmm. um, you know, dimension when they got to that point in their conversations, which he did say it took a while. 
Uh, so again, I think we need to repeat that that it does take a while. It's just not all of a sudden. Yeah. Uh, he he said that they didn't they didn't ask questions because that was turning a little too logical for the time being. Right. Um, but they stayed focused on the emotions, which which shows you that uh, they stayed focused on understanding that in, instead of poking and priming and trying to get their point across, really what they did was they empathized with one another, um, and they used that kind of listening to go even deeper. Right, right, right. And that's kind of something, he didn't mention this, but now that you say it, I find this kind of interesting in that, you know, often our emotions get in the way of effectively communicating. Yeah. If we let our emotions, um, you know, bubble up inside us and, and then control us in our actions. Right. But what's funny is that, where emotions get important is when he's talking about this deep communication, right? Mm -hmm. So it's almost like surface level communication and I'm kind of, I'm oversimplifying it, but for the sake of this idea, um, surface level communication doesn't bode well with emotions necessarily, you know what I mean? And just communicating clearly and, you know, either that setting expectations, you know what I mean? And, and things like that. But, uh, um, you know, speaking to your emotions actually, uh, fit, in this kind of deeper level of communication, really getting to like the soul of the person. Mm -hmm. And that's where feelings and emotion can kind of come through and be expressed in an environment like that. Right. Which I find kind of interesting in the way that he, he doesn't explicitly say that in this chapter, but that's kind of the idea that I'm, I'm just kind of picking up on off right, of that. Right. Yeah. And he and he takes that idea and he also talks about the importance of this generationally mm-hmm. as well. And he got to one of our favorite parts of all of these habits when he talks about not not just uh, transferring scripts, you know, taking scripts that you may learn um, from generations before you, but transi- transitioning them and writing a new script. And so one of the most powerful examples I found uh, relating to what you were talking about was um, when he said that, you know, let's say that you're, you know, your father uh, abuses you. Um, and, you know, in most cases, we see that those who are abused turn around and abuse right. someone else. And so they're taking that script and they're transferring it. Mm-hmm. But in fact, in these seven habits, you can become effective and you can transition that and not follow that same script. I think that's the most liberating principle right. out yeah. of all these principles um, that we find that you do have the power. And this is, and this is really, I mean, this book really is, you know, some people would categorize it as self-help, but I, I really think it's a really, these are really powerful tools to really turn your life around and to write a new script, no matter what you've experienced in the past. Right. Now you can write something new. Right. Um, so I'm, I'm very glad that he mentioned that specifically in this chapter as it, yeah, you know, this book comes to Yeah, a it's not just a habit one, but all these habits kind of help in re-scripting, um, you know, maybe old scripts or bad scripts that you may have. Right. And he takes one of the maybe the worst, you know, possible uh, situations in right. life, you know, and uses that and as, as an example that it is possible. Right. Um, but it can also, even if it's not the worst situation, something that extreme, it can be done in any negative or just not beneficial situation in that we may be in. Right. In life. You right. know what I mean? It yeah, doesn't yeah, have yeah. to be that extreme. You can still take, if it's not a helpful and beneficial script, you can still take it and uh, change it yes. to something better. And you can transition into, as they say, transition uh, instead of transfer. Yes. You can transition into something better. Right. That then you can you can help uh, pass down um, to future generations is yes. basically what he's saying here. Is yes. It's not only just a you thing, mm-hmm. but it's also a transitional thing that you can then, um, 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 that you can then transfer to other people. Yes. Yeah. And this, and he says that this is really done. Uh, and he mentions this again, I think because it's, it's so important to him. He mentions again, this idea of a personal missions uh, statement. Mm-hmm. Um, and he says, that's what you lead out of, right. you know, you select your values and then you lead from them. Right. Um, and we could, we can identify different leaders throughout the, throughout the ages who have, who have done exactly that they've led from their, from their values. Um, whether they personally wrote down a mission <laughs> statement or not, uh, we, we see that that's what they did. And th- and those mm-hmm. are those effective people, mm-hmm. uh, is that you, you set, you decide, um, that, that you're responsible for your response on um, that. You can be proactive, all of those, you know, private habits. Um, and then, you know, after, after the, uh, transition, um, you begin to develop those, uh, those, uh, 
public victories and you are able to write that new script um, and, and do it in a way um, that reflects the values in the personal mission statement that hopefully you've <laughs> written out if you've read this book or, you know, live, live out those values that you state that you have. Right, right. Yeah, and he basically kind of then transfers to summing up this chapter and kind of summing up this yeah. book even in just kind of reiterating that, you know, these seven habits and kind of living this way, uh, living from this principle-centered uh, life, mm-hmm. principle-centered living, and basically sums it all up again in just that this is not just kind of like it's not it's almost more than just effective living right. but it's kind of like living on a higher plane and in a sense that this is just overall just a better way to live than most of us live and right. and it's really kind of taking pushing aside superficial things mm-hmm. and non-important things that plea for our attention mm-hmm. and focusing on what's really important right. um, in life and then guiding our steps to fit that criteria. Yes. Yeah. And how that leads to then just an overall better life. Right. Day in and day out. Right. Right. Yeah. And then he, at the very, very end, uh, he leaves us with a personal note. Right. Which I was actually, if I can interject for a second, Mm -hmm. I was actually anticipating this section because I knew, I I knew Stephen Covey um, was a Christian. Mm Mm-hmm. But uh, I was looking for this section back in Habit 2 when we were talking about principle-centered living because okay. we discussed that. He, right. he never clarifies what, you know, um, um, where he gets his pr- principles so specifically, right. but that it's important to have a principled-centered uh, view of the world and live uh, principle-centered. But right. I was, but he puts it here at the end of the at the end of the book uh, yeah. just for clarification. And I think that's for people. I think that's to make it the book. Uh, welcoming to people who who aren't Christians, yes. right? It's it's so to reach that broader audience. Um, but then he he wants to still clarify at the end here where he gets his principles and that where he gets them, he thinks that it's timeless. Right? Yeah, I was going to say I was actually surprised that he included this okay. in here. Um, <laughs> is actually what I was going to say. Um, so that's interesting that you kind of anticipated it even back further before this because I definitely. Um, you know, coming from a theology background, mm-hmm. I could I could definitely pick apart and, and tell you, you know, okay, this, you know, this may be historically kind of where he's getting this from, or this mm-hmm. has kind of a theological reflection to it. So I'm just operated that way and think that way. And so I was rather surprised that he did put this at the end. Um, but I think he strategically put it at the end, just like you said, um, not to you know, keep people away from this material just in case you don't hold that same view because you can still be an effective person um, and live out these seven habits, even if you don't personally agree with his personal note at the end of the book. But I, right. I just wanted to mention, since that was the very end, um, I was actually quite surprised that he put that in there. Yeah, yeah. So, well, I wasn't expecting it there, but I was looking for something like that in, in Habit too. Yeah. But didn't, but didn't get it, but he puts it here. And right. basically, he just says that I think where I get my principles for living yes. is from uh, Jesus and the life that he lived. Um, and that and that the principles that he put in place and that God has put in place, mm-hmm. that those are what are timeless and that those will never, um, those are not just based on, you know, values that you may have, but they're based on things that are just true and they're, and they're at work in, in, in life, whether you live that or not. Right. Yeah. And yeah. he meant, he makes the, the interesting analogy that, you know, he said, uh, gangs and, um, you know, and criminal enterprises have values. <laughs> yes. True. You know what I mean? Right. Just because you have values doesn't mean that they're good. <laughs> yes. Right. Right. So, and that's what he means when he's talking about principles versus values is that the principles are, are, are structural to, uh, to life and how how this world operates, right? Um, whether you whether you believe them or not, right? Yeah, what? Yeah, and whether you believe in God or not, I mean, certainly we all have a sense of what's good and what's right. bad, and so what would be what would be values, and just in in the opposite. Um, there was a quote at the very end in his personal notes that really struck out to me. It was a quote he quoted someone else saying this, mm-hmm. but it what it was um, that we are not human beings doing spiritual things, yeah. but spiritual beings doing 
you know, human things in mm-hmm. a sense to kind of to kind of summarize it. Um, so again, I was quite surprised that he per- put that personal note in there. But for anyone who was curious about kind of where he was coming from, you read that personal note, you reflect back on the rest of the book, which is what he's trying to get you to do in this chapter anyway, and you kind of see where he's coming from all along. And so I personally look forward to rereading this book, knowing what's to come, uh, and reflecting on that as you read presently through the book again. So right, I'll right, definitely right. be reading this book again, that's for sure. Yeah, I had that same uh, thought as well. Now, you know, after reading Habit 7 in this final chapter um, and having gone through the habits, rereading yeah. starting at the beginning, I'm definitely, I think I'm going to have a different way of looking at, at yeah. that stuff. Some things maybe I haven't, or that, that quite didn't click with me, right. maybe would click uh, the next time around. Um, so yeah, maybe, maybe I'll, uh, give this book a re-listen to here yeah. in the future, in mm-hmm. the next few months, or maybe I'll go back and listen to the podcast That's right. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and get it that way. So yeah. I don't know, maybe we'll, uh, 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 but either way I'll have to circle back around to this right. and I think it'll be interesting to see it maybe come alive in a different way. Um, a second or third time around. Yes, yeah. And I know I know for you and I both there were some specific quotes that we wanted to pull yep. out of this short chapter. So, let's pull out the yeah, book let's and do look it. at them. All right, so we're back. We have our books out in front of us. Um, we're just going to go over a couple of our favorite quotes from this chapter and then talk about some of the things that maybe we didn't quite cover in the first part. Um, so starting off, I just want to read the the quote that he has about stimulus and response. Um, He says, there is a gap or space between stimulus and response and that the key to both our growth and happiness is how we use that space. Yes. Again, just kind of reiterating. I think he 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 says it very clearly there. Yes. um, That it's our growth and happiness can be uh, controlled and even um, created in the space between stimulus and response, even when it doesn't seem like that's the case. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm Because oftentimes when he's talking about stimulus here, he's probably talking about it and it's not as, it's not something that we were actually, we were hoping for or longing for or wanting to happen. Yes. But it's how we respond is that's, that's where the growth and, and happiness lies in responding yes. uh, well to things that are not what we wanted. Yes. Yeah. And, and he gives kind of like the byproduct of doing this well, mm-hmm. as we mentioned in the story of him and his wife. At one point in that story, he says, but little by little, Our communication deepened. And this is where people really, uh, they may not phrase it this way, but this is where they want to be in their relationships. I don't think anyone would deny this, Mm -hmm. that their communication deepened. And he says, we begin to talk more and more about our internal worlds, because at first they talk about, you know, surface level things for the most part. And that's what I would describe most of our conversations as. I mean, they may be helpful and beneficial and it may build our emotional bank account. However, for the most part, they are uh, surface level. Um, and, And he says about our internal worlds, which would include, you know, our upbringing, our scripting, our feelings, and also our self doubts as well. So the result of this response, this healthy response was this place in their conversation and in their relationship. Right. So right. some really good things happen in there. Right. And I also want to point out that he says here that them getting to this point of like deep communication, mm-hmm. maybe in a way that they hadn't at, at any point up until that point in their marriage happened when they had, he says over two hours of basically uninterrupted communication every day for yeah. about a year. Yeah. That's how much, that's how much work it takes. Right. Yeah. It's a lot of, it's a lot of time and a lot of energy and a lot of effort right. to get to that point. Point. Right. Yeah. And we, and we mentioned these two rules as well, but he says gradually over this, you know, two, you know, this, this period uh, in which they spoke to each other two hours, uh, you know, uh, for a year, he said gradually there was two unspoken rules, the no probing, which we mentioned earlier, mm-hmm. um, which really happened. He says, as soon as we unfolded the inner layers of vulnerability, uh, we were not to question each other, only to empathize. And yeah. so that's, that's where, uh, that comes into play. And then the second one as well, um, which if it's too hurtful, too painful, simply quit for the day. And then, you know, don't, don't probe and ask them to bring it up later. You know, it may come up as soon as they started talking the next day again, or maybe it took a little while, but it was based on that person's comfort level to get there. Right. And, uh, yeah, especially as soon as you read that, I think, you, if you're like me, you think of you think of situations where those things have happened, right? And you you maybe you you try and open up 
and you try and be a little bit more vulnerable than you usually do to a you know a person in a relationship and as soon as there's any kind of anything other than empathy yeah you start to shut down again yeah. and that's that's just how it works um and uh, even you know times where maybe i've done this people have tried to open up with me and i didn't see it for what it was mm-hmm. and and instead of responding in empathy you know i probed or made another comment or something like that and and uh, they shut down. Yeah. Yeah. And I think these two ground rules, I think the amazing thing about it is, of course, he was writing and reflecting on this as he was creating this chapter and writing this book. And so this is not something I would imagine he realized in the moment, but it took reflection and thought afterwards, which is something that he does challenge us to do in our relationships um, and something really that we need to do to, to transition our scripts as as we'll talk about is to take time and to and to reflect so these two unspoken unspoken rules probably they didn't realize in the in the moment but he, he's reflecting back looking at this and saying this was really really helpful so let me give you these two principles for you to fit into your relationship paradigms yeah. to see how how they work um, and I think that they can work really well as he's shown us before yeah but you and you want to oh go ahead yeah he gives an well he gives an example of how you know basically them following these rules led to this uh, situation yes he talks about how is this the Frigidaire story yes okay yes. I was just about to say why don't you have a story see we're just we're just on the same wavelength bro yep we are anyway yeah. that's what ahead. happens when you do ten podcasts uh, right. with each other just, just imagine, think about when we're in thirty or forty that's podcasts right we'll in. be pretty much saying the same thing. At the same time? At oh. the same time. Oh, shoot. <laughs> Not there yet. We'll get yep, there. We'll get there. Um, but he's talking about, he's talking about um, their like kitchen appliances and, and it's Frigidaire, right? Mm-hmm. That's the brand. So his wife uh, loves Frigidaire appliances <laughs> and will not get anything else, even to right. the point of where it seems un- unlogical right. to like the point of driving like, you know, hours out of town to go to a store that has these appliances to look at them to buy them Mm -hmm. and he doesn't understand it and he's never understood it the entire time that they've been married and it's probably gotten them in countless arguments right but it it wasn't almost that big a deal because it only happened when they needed a new appliance right so so it was something that he it just bothered him to to no end but it just came up so infrequently that they never dealt with it Mm -hmm. so he talks about this in their in their deep communication sessions and talking about this it ends up coming up and because they're following these rules of no probing and no, and stopping when it hurts and, right. and, and those things, um, they kind of get to the bottom of this. And it actually it turns out, and I'm kind of you know summarizing this uh, yeah. very quickly, but it gets to the point where the reason that she had such a connection to those appliances was actually because um, her father um, uh, relied on that company um, for so long when they were financially uh, struggling or financially tight. Yes. And... And his and her father, um, you know, told her about that and was communicating yeah. her about that. And they that bonded. Way. They bonded over that, right? And I know you're going to share a quote, uh, but while you're on this mm-hmm. part right here, I'm not reading the same one that I know that you'll read. Uh, he he says that I came to realize that Sandra wasn't talking about the appliances. Yeah. <laughs> that she was talking about her father and about loyalty, um, about loyalty to his needs. And so they discussed yeah. those needs, and it created that bond. Yeah, yeah. And so doing this deep communication, it got them to the point where he then realized that that it's it's not it's it's about more than just the the fridge basically you know and he says here that we discovered that even seemingly trivial things often have roots in deep emotional experiences and to deal only with just the superficial trivia without seeing the deeper more tender issues is to trample on the sacred ground of another's heart mm-hmm. and uh, I think a lot of times we we probably we don't even realize that when we come across things that were like, that doesn't make any sense to me. Why would someone do that? Why would they do that? Well, there's probably other deep underlying things that, that cause them to think that way or to do that. And um, we just don't see it because we're not connected. We, we don't come with enough understanding and enough uh, empathic listening yeah. to be able to properly communicate and then get to that level where they where, 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 where that is communicated. Right. And you kind of get to that deeper level of understanding and learning. Yeah, this is just another another story where, again, you, you begin to pull back the layers and look at the details of the story. And, uh, 
you know, kind of a good reading tip as we're going through here, since we know the seven habits is maybe to take this chapter and to, you know, if you have a physical copy, you know, to circle and put, you know, oh, this reflects this habit that he's doing well, or this Mm -hmm. reflects this habit that she's doing well so that we can see how integrated they are. Um, because you begin to pull back the layers of and details of these stories and that's what he's showing you. Right. Uh, and why he's reflecting on this book as a whole here at the very end. Right. And it's really kind of like just seeing the deeper meaning in, in all the little things in life, like even the trivial, the small things, they all can have some kind of deeper meaning and it helps you kind of just live with more purpose. Right. Really. Yeah, I it think does. when you see the deeper meaning in, in the trivial, uh, things. Right. Yes. He, um, moves on from this, this section and goes into the intergenerational mm-hmm. living, um, where he does, I wanted to read this quote where he does mention some specific habits and also mentions quadrant two again, which he does quite, quite a bit, uh, as we lead up to the end. But he says, um, that the delicious fruits, a, in other words, a rich win-win relationship, mm-hmm. a deep understanding of each other and a marvelous synergy grew out of the roots. We nurtured as we examined our programs, rescripted ourselves and managed our lives so that we could create time for the important quadrant two activity because them, them spending all this time talking with one another. And as he starts talking about in this section, the intergenerational relationships and how important those things are, and then goes into the uh, transfer or transitioning the scripts. Um, he, he says that um, as, as we nurtured that, this quadrant two activity, that's all this is, this quadrant two activity uh, of, of community, of communicating deeply with each other. And so in a sense, in that one little paragraph, it's almost as if he touches on just about every single habit just in that one uh paragraph there so that's why i wanted right. to read that yeah quote. yeah and he also you know adds before before that he said they tried the outside in approach yes. they tried working on the the um the attitudes and behaviors practicing techniques yeah and uh and they realized that you know those are just band-aids on the actual issues and things and yeah and until they worked and communicated on the level of our essential paradigms and the chronic underlying problems um uh, until they worked on those, the chronic underlying problems were still there. Right. And that's what he's talking about when you read that quote is that when they got to that, uh, when they got there and they started actually got to that point, then that's when things started turning around. Right. Yeah. And um, this is skipping ahead a little bit, but I think it applies to what you just said, because um, as, I, as I said, he goes into this, um, you know, transition a script in this section becoming a transition person, um, which I feel like we we covered uh, pretty well. But he he says that change, real change, comes mm-hmm. from the inside out. Because just like you said, he said we tried the outside in approach, yep. and it just doesn't create change. He says real change comes from the inside out. Um, it doesn't come from hacking at the leaves of attitude and behavior with quick fix personality ethnic. Uh, ethic techniques. Um, it comes from striking at the root, um, the fabric of our thoughts, right. essential paradigms. That's where the real change comes right, from. Right. And he says here, just like you, you know, just like we mentioned earlier about, you know, if you were, you know, say abused as a, as a child, something that is a, a, a very negative situation and anything that's anything else that might be a negative situation, but not to that extreme the thing is you can write it in your personal mission statement and into your mind and heart in how you want to change your behavior and how yep. you want to live. You can visualize yourself living in harmony with that mission statement in your daily private victory. You can take steps to love and forgive your own parents, and if they are still living, build a positive relationship with them by seeking to understand. Yeah. So, you know, again, just just that the, the seven habits are a step to move past any negative situation. Yes. Even like, you know, um, you know, they say, oh, this terrible thing happened to me, or I'm in this terrible situation. Well, almost like the answer is working on these seven habits in a sense. Yeah. Yeah. And what these seven habits do, I keep, I keep kind of skipping ahead and going, because there's things that you're saying that I, that I'm looking at my book and these things that I have highlighted and it's uh, reflecting on those. Uh, But he says, as you work on these seven habits, really what you get is you're achieving unity. Mm -hmm. He says oneness with ourselves and with loved ones. In other words, in the the private victories and in the public victories with our friends and working associates. He says it's the highest 
and best and most delicious fruit of the seven habits. And right. so that's the result of these seven habits is unity, unity. Uh, which is very... And that's hard enough to do just even oh, gosh. with yourself, let alone with other yeah. people. Yeah, very, very hard. Um, and I think that we could all agree that that's really what we want. And so I'm right. so glad um, that this is kind of the the path that he takes us on, is, is re- really all these seven habits are going to bring unity to our lives with ourselves and with other people, um, which is really a beautiful yeah. thing because our yeah. world is missing so much of that. Yeah, and just imagine, man, if we all internalize these and we yeah. all practice these and we all were able to work in unity with each other, Yeah, I mean, the possibilities are endless. Yeah, they are. Yeah, and uh, man, and he says, obviously building a character of total integrity and living is the life of love and service that creates such unity. Um, and that isn't easy. It isn't a quick fix, but it's possible. Right. And uh, sometimes we make mistakes. Sometimes we feel awkward. But if we start with the daily private victory yep. and work from the inside out, the results will surely come as we plant the seed and patiently weed and nourish it. We begin to feel the excitement of real growth and eventually taste the incomparably delicious fruits of a congruent, effective life. You know, again, it's not a quick fix. No. It's not, uh, you know, one and done. We don't have these mastered. And, you know, we don't have, just because we read this book in 10 weeks, we don't have all this mastered and, and done. But but working on it daily and practicing it, revisiting it, mm-hmm. re-reading it, um, you know, digesting the material even more. Eventually, like he says here, we plant the seed, and eventually, it's gonna it's gonna grow into something uh, pretty big. That's right. And it's gonna have a long term uh, beneficial impact uh, later down the road in life. Right. So he ends the chapter with this quote here: "By centering our lives on correct principles and creating a balanced focus between doing and increasing our ability to do, we become empowered in the task of creating effective, useful, and peaceful lives for ourselves mm-hmm. and for our posterity." Yeah. Yeah. Awesome stuff. Yeah. I'm so glad that he ended with this, this chapter, uh, and something that I, I think that people should take the time to read. Uh, if you have the book is the afterword, uh, which is questions that he's often asked. And so that was interesting. We're not going to review those, but it just, you know, gives some background, some personality, I think to the book as a whole, as you go back, uh, and read it. But I was curious, I did want to ask as we bring this episode to a close, this last episode of, for this, for this particular book, which, habit was your favorite to read to learn about and then also kind of you know the one you look most forward to carrying out right yeah that's a great question um i think probably my favorite one probably can i guess before you say it yeah sure i I don't know this for sure i just wanted to guess Uh is it is it synergize um no actually that's not what i was gonna say okay i was gonna say habit too okay um, yeah because i think i think this is the one at least for me i think this is probably the one that i have uh, maybe the most trouble grasping mm-hmm. and um not because um you know not because I'm not I don't want to but it's one of those things it's the it seems to me to be the hardest one to carve out the time to do <laughs> yes that's the it's the it's the one that is probably like almost the most quadrant two of them all like you have to carve out the time it's not going to happen on its own it's never just going to end up being important and you're going to have to do it. Um, you have to make the time. And But I think if if I were, if me personally, if I were to get this one down, there would be so much less wasted, I think, time. Yes. You know what I mean? It basically, you know, I would never be worried about am I wasting time right. <laughs> doing this or doing that. You know, it's, it's just an overall... Um, I think you just have a, a clarity around life and what you're supposed to be doing. Yeah, yeah, no, that's a good point. Yeah, um, I'm surprised now. F- for me, I'm I'm surprised that uh, that's that's in the private victories. Yeah. You know that that would be a favorite uh, because I, I, in my opinion, I think the private victories are a little bit harder to master in a sense mm-hmm. than the not that the uh, public victories aren't difficult because they are. Um, my favorite is in the public victories, which is habit five, uh-huh. uh, to seek to understand. And I, I see just as I try to do that, how much already in small ways, how that has helped, you know, friendships, relationships, right. you know, it's particularly with my, with my wife as well. Um, when she has moments of, you know, being distraught or anger or whatever it may be, um, trying to understand 
and it takes a lot of pressure off of you because right. you're no longer fighting uh, to be understood, um, but you're seeking to understand. Um, and so that's, that's a really good, you know, that that's the, since that's the first, uh, or excuse me, since that's the second habit out of those public victories, um, I think it also, in my opinion, is the most impactful, um, and one that you can begin right, right after you learn about it to try to practice and and do. Yeah. Yeah. So that was, that was my favorite. And that's an interesting thought about, about that one is that, you know, following that habit, uh, you don't have to think of what to say. No. You don't have to try and be like, "Oh my gosh, what am I going to say? I got to say something really, really uh, wise mm-hmm. or something or mm-hmm. smart or you know what I mean." You're not you're not about trying to figure out what you're going to say. Right. So um, it takes one less thing out of the equation where you know you have that opportunity to maybe you know say something maybe you shouldn't have said or try and try and say something or feel pressured to say something smart or wise or helpful in the moment. Yeah. When you can just listen and and learn and uh, try to understand yeah. first. Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. Yeah, but I, I I do love habit two as well. Like you said, it clarifies your life so much. It focuses it so much. Mm-hmm. You stay concentrated on the things that really really matter, the things you want to be remembered for. Right. Um, I would say one of the one of the more difficult habits. Yeah. But I'm glad that you brought that up because that is a really good one. Yeah. Yeah. Well. That uh, that pretty much does it. We that's, are that's done. That's the book, man. Yeah, we are done with the Seven Habits of Highly Effective People by Stephen Covey. Um, I've uh, I've thoroughly enjoyed this book. Yeah, I don't know about you, but I've uh, I've enjoyed it a lot. Yeah, me too. I I think it's gonna be hard to find another book that touches and affects so many different areas of our life. I'm super excited to go into Bob Goff's book. It's gonna have a little bit different spin. He's definitely a different writer yeah. uh, than Stephen Covey. So being able to break those down, it's gonna be a lot of fun. Yep. So. Next week, next Monday, will be the first episode of Bob Goff's Dream Big. And then from then on, it'll be daily episodes until we finish that book. So next Monday, you have a week Mm -hmm. to uh, pick up the book and uh, follow along with us. That's right. So I'm looking forward to it. Yeah, get the book, follow along, read with us. Uh, email us, you know, as, as you have thoughts and different things about the book and we're going to have a really good time discussing it. Yeah. Looking forward to it. All right. Thanks guys for listening and, uh, we'll see you in the next one.